were. And uh, the same thing was true in the United States. Standard Oil never had a tanker torpedo during World War II because Standard Oil was channeling oil to Nazi Germany. The Germans bloody well knew this, and uh, they, they, uh, their intelligence people made sure that uh, the Standard Oil tankers did not get torpedoed. Not a single Standard Oil tanker was torpedoed during the entire course of World War II, at least in the Atlantic. And that was no accident. To give you an idea of how uh, not only profound these connections were, but the extent to which they operated even in wartime. It's a, a very... Uh, it's fascinating in one sense and grotesque in another. One of the main names to understand uh, in uh, grasping how some of this uh, transatlantic corporate networking and how this in turn uh, affected the development of the American elite and our intelligence system, or how it uh, was utilized by the American elite and our, uh, the development of our civilian intelligence agencies, the Stinnis firm was one of the most important names to understand here. Now, there was a German-American elitist, um, a, a, an industrialist, and also a uh, society person named Giro von Gebernitz, last name G-A-E-V-E-R-N-I-T-Z. It's a very important name to understand. He married the sister of a key member of the Stinnis family, whose first name I forget offhand, uh, and uh, Gevernitz was part of this transatlantic financial and industrial axis. He was a uh, well-known and influential figure in both German and in both European and American elite society at this time. He married into the Stinnis family. His sister, I believe, was... Uh, his wife, rather, was the sister of Edmund Stinnis. It might have been one of the other Stinnises. But this, and again, the Stinnis family were Germans, but they also functioned in the United States. And uh, uh, Gebernitz's brother-in-law taught at Haverford College. That's one of the elite American small uh, colleges. Haverford, uh, Swarthmore, uh, the Little Three Amherst, uh, Wesleyan and Williams are some of the elite small institutions. But again, uh, we actually have a member of the Stinnis family teaching yeah, working as a professor at Haverford College in Pennsylvania, again, one of the finishing schools, so to speak, one of the uh, colleges from which the uh, Philadelphia mainline elite would frequently channel their, uh, their progeny. Giro von Gebernitz got to know Alan Dulles very well during this period of time because Dulles was part of the American component of this transatlantic financial and industrial axis. Now, Alan Dulles, uh, when war came, uh, being ever the patriot, and that is said with deep sarcasm, uh, wanted to make his name in uh, the course of uh, World War II. It's interesting as you, as you study these things to see how many of these people, uh, while functioning as major movers and shakers of the of uh, world uh, this, the world situation and the American national security establishment in particular were doing so with an eye towards their career with an eye towards careerism uh, it's interesting to contemplate too how many people died in particular American GIs have died over the years as a result of uh, rivalries or oversights I alluded earlier to the rivalry between Wild Bill Donovan and Douglas MacArthur going back to the Rainbow Division in World War One when Donovan refused to withdraw the fighting 69th to lead German troops into a MacArthur plan trap. Well, because of this, when MacArthur became the chief commander of U.S. ground forces in the Pacific in World War II, they, they actively frustrated OSS operations in the Pacific theater. And ultimately, MacArthur entrusted most of his intelligence operations to a German-American fascist named Karl Adolf von Chappe und Wiedenbach, uh, who was educated at the Kriegswehr Academy, the German equivalent of West Point, ultimately uh, changed his name to Major General Charles Willoughby. He was a, a doctrinaire fascist. Even MacArthur referred to him as uh, our, my lovable fascist which should have been an oxymoron, but for MacArthur, sadly, was not. Uh, and uh, it was the uh, German-born fascist and ardent admirer of, and after his retirement from the military, advisor to Francisco Franco, who uh, became the chief intelligence officer for MacArthur, who hated the OSS, who had a rivalry with the OSS, actively frustrated OSS operations. It's interesting to contemplate how many GIs in the Pacific Theater wound up under white crosses in cemeteries because of snafus stemming from this particular rivalry. Again, that's something of a, of a parent Parenthetical aside and a digression. But Alan Dulles, uh, ever the careerist and uh, ever the patriot, and that said extremely sarcastically, uh, none other than Arthur Goldberg, uh, later a Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court and an OSS officer, by the way, characterized Alan Dulles as, a, quote, an American traitor, unquote, which I think was a generous treatment of Alan Dulles. Uh, Alan Dulles was posted to the Bern, Switzerland office of the OSS, and his 
functions in Bern, Switzerland. Again, Switzerland nominally a neutral country, but in fact a clearinghouse for capital machinations from this very same transatlantic industrial and financial axis. Uh, Switzerland was a hotbed of diplomatic uh, espionage and economic activity in this period of time. And Alan Dulles, again along with his brother John Foster, a key uh, player in Sullivan and Cromwell, was posted to the Bern, Switzerland OSS office. William Stevenson had been tapping Alan Dulles' phone lines in New York, basically in order to gain uh, information about, about Alan Dulles' collaboration with the Nazis in World War II. That wiretapping continued after Alan Dulles went to uh, Bern, Switzerland. The British continued to at least to attempt to uh, wiretap Alan Dulles, because Dulles was basically a traitor. Now, while Alan Dulles was in Bern, Switzerland, he was contacted by representatives of German uh, society, of German industry and finance, and also German intelligence. Uh, these people were functioning uh, in all of these capacities at the same time. The savvier heads among uh, the German high command had seen early on that Germany was destined to lose World War II. In particular, when Germany failed to knock out the Soviet Union before the, the Russian winter came in 1941, uh, it was understood that they were going to lose the war. Uh, in fact, the German uh, general staff was making plans to survive defeat as early as October of 1941, even before America entered World War II, because A, they knew they were not going to capture uh, Moscow before the Russian winter set in. They had no plans for a protracted war on the Eastern Front. They, had, they did not have the equipment to winter inside of Russia or inside of the Soviet Union, and they, the winter of 1941 was one of the most brutal on record. And they knew that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor, bringing America into the war, which would have placed, this they knew, would place the Axis, not just Germany, uh, Japan, and Italy, but also Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Finland, and for a time the Baltic states, or for a time Finland and also the Baltic states, into uh, a war with uh, the Allies, which at that point, once the U.S. entered the war, would have been not only the uh, Soviet Union with all of its population and, and manufacturing capability, but also China, the most populous nation on Earth, the United States with its population and manufacturing capability, and also the entire British Empire, including Canada, Australia, and India. And they knew, simply from a logistical standpoint and from a strategic standpoint, they were going to lose. There was no way the Axis could uh, tangle with that much power and win. So by and when Alan Dulles arrived in Bern, Switzerland, uh, he was contacted immediately. He basically sort of had an open house and all sorts of German industrialists and financiers and spies and uh, shills and uh, all sorts of people uh, regularly beat a path to Alan Dulles's door. And uh, in particular, one of the people who uh, was an intimate of Dulles at this time period was one of his previous acquaintances from... Okay. Oh, so we didn't lose any of the... Okay, great, fantastic. Um, one of the people who was uh, one, of, uh, one of Dulles' intimates in this time period, was one of his acquaintances from the elite industrial fin and financial uh, axis that uh, figures front and center in this story of networking that uh, I'm setting forth here, the aforementioned Giro von Gevernitz, a German aristocrat, uh, one of the intimates of this financial and industrial axis, an in-law of the Stinnis family, as I indicated earlier, and one of the individuals who was trying to uh, convince Alan Dulles to adopt the Christian West concept. Now, because the Germans understood relatively early on that they were going to lose the war, the savvier heads in Germany anyway, uh, they began to jockey for post-World War II position, even as the guns were blazing all around the world. And one of the concepts, one of the contingency plans that the Germans developed in order to survive military defeat in World War II was the Christian West concept. What this entailed was the removing of Hitler and at least ostensibly, at least on the surface, the SS and some of the more obvious and obnoxious elements of Nazism and for the incorporation of the Hitlerless Reich into a pan-European and transatlantic military and political alliance with Germany as the keystone, an anti-Soviet pan-European and transatlantic alliance. Again, with a Hitlerless Reich as the cornerstone of this alliance. This was known by the breakers, as they were known, those who broke with Hitler, as the Christian West concept. And Alan Dulles, as a head of the Bern OSS office, uh, was the point man involved with the Christian West negotiations, which ultimately, after World War II, were to uh, be successfully realized. The Christian Westers were hoping, basically, for a mid-war turnaround. Basically, Germany was going to kick out Hitler and uh, ostensibly, at least, the SS, 
And then the new cleansed or sanitized Reich was going to ally with Germany and France, or with the United States and France and Britain in an anti-Soviet crusade. This was not viable during the war itself when tempers were so heated and a lot of people had had uh, loved ones killed by uh, the Axis uh, nations. However, as we'll see, uh, ultimately the Christian West concept was realized in the post-World War II period. But the key negotiator with Alan Dulles for the Christian Westers was none other than Giro von Gevernitz. Another of the negotiators was a uh, fellow who married into the Habsburg family, Prince Max Egon von Hohenlohe. That's uh, H-O-H-E-N-L-O-E. Uh, they were actually technically Jews, or at least some members of the family were, but they were pro-fascist. They were part of the Habsburg aristocracy, and they became uh, what Hitler referred to, what the Nazis referred to as honorary Aryans. If a Jew in Germany was sufficiently influential and wealthy and would back the Nazi regime, they became honorary Aryans, basically, and the Hohenlohes were uh, some of those honorary Aryans, Princess Stephanie von Hohenlohe, emigrated to the United States and became part of uh, elite society up on the peninsula in the Bay Area. She became an intimate, for example, of the Hearst family in San Francisco. Uh, the Hearst ca compound in San Mateo uh, was uh, regularly habituated by Princess von Hohenlohe, and she was uh, basically... Uh, courting American uh, Bay Area elite society on behalf of the Nazis. But, of course, she was okay because she was Jewish. She was an honorary Aryan. Well, uh, her relative, Prince Max Egon von Hohenlohe, along with Giro von Gevernitz, again, married into the Stinnes family, one of the main families involved in this transatlantic industrial and financial axis, is negotiating with Alan Dulles in Switzerland to establish the Christian West concept. A veteran German intelligencer and diplomat has maintained that he was present at a meeting in Spain in 1943 where William Donovan himself Again, the same William Donovan who commanded the fighting 69th in World War I, the same William Donovan who was dispatched by J.P. Morgan in 1920 on a fact-finding and, according to some, uh, fund-distributing mission to Europe in 1920 to uh, assess the political situation in Europe and, according to some, to help finance political reaction in Europe. Uh, the same William Donovan who uh, became head of the OSS, ultimately, uh, according to uh, a couple of eyewitness participants, agreed to the Christian West concept in Spain in 1943. This has never actually been corroborated uh, by others. Uh, in other words, that the Christian West uh, concept was agreed to in 1943, but it's apparent from what took place after World War II that the Christian West uh, was put into effect. It was not put into effect while the guns were still firing, but immediately afterward, it was. Now, the interesting thing about the breakers is that they were ostensibly uh, going to rebel against Hitler and that they were going to get rid of Hitler and that this would permit the realization of the Christian West concept. But in fact, as a number, God bless, as a number of critics of uh, Alan Dulles' operations pointed out, it was extremely unlikely that a contingent of this size and of this influence could have operated clandestinely in Germany without the knowledge of the authorities. And in fact, that was the case, because Giro von Gevernitz, again an in-law of the Stinnes family, an intimate of Alan Dulles, part and parcel to this transatlantic industrial and financial axis I'm talking about, uh, Giro von Gevernitz was acting as a proxy for Walter Schellenberg. Now, Schellenberg, remember, was in charge of all overseas intelligence for the SS, for the Sicherheitsdienst, to the literally security service. That was the intelligence service of the SS. And Schellenberg was in charge of all overseas intelligence for the SD, for the Sicherheitsdienst. He also, remember, was a member of the board of directors of the German subsidiary of IT&T, and throughout the entire course of the war, while in charge of overseas intelligence for the SS, was being paid a director's salary out of New York. And again, the uh, extent to which these operations proceeded undisturbed throughout the entire course of the World War II, entire course of World War II, would have been worthy of Joseph Heller in Catch-22. It's, it's uh, quite real. Just one second here while I uh, moisten my whistle here. So what we're seeing, as the guns are blazing in Europe, we have Alan Dulles from Sullivan and Cromwell in Bern, Switzerland, hobnobbing with Giro von Gevernitz, uh, intimate of the Stinnes family, operating as a proxy for Walter, Sch Walter Schellenberg in charge of overseas intelligence for the SS and serving as a member of the board of directors of German I, this, the German subsidiary of IT&T and being paid a director's salary out of New York. It's basically sort of a uh, transatlantic political and, and industrial daisy chain of uh, no small note. 
And uh, it is in this time period that much of the post-World War II character of U.S. intelligence and of the world was set. And I'm going to sort of uh, end the discussion uh, in the post-World War, in, in, in very soon, but I'm not going to go all the way up through the 50s and 60s and so forth. But it's worth noting that uh, it was Gerolf von Gevernitz who introduced General Edwin Siebert, who was uh, one of the top military intelligence officers in Europe. Now, bear in mind that there was this rivalry between the OSS and military intelligence, which then carried on into the post-World War II period when military intelligence hated CIA and, to a certain extent, the other way around, even though they often collaborated in covert operations. Uh, none other than Giro von Gevernitz introduced General Edwin Siebert, once the guns fell silent, to Nazi Major General Reinhard Galen, who was Hitler's top intelligence officer for the Eastern Front in World War II, who still had his agent networks in place throughout Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, who had his entire file system intact uh, at, at this time period, and who, as uh, most of you I'm sure know either from previous lectures and or the programs, ultimately uh, jumped with his entire outfit, not only Hitler's Eastern Front intelligence outfit, but with, with much of the Odessa, the post-World War II to SS Underground jumped to U.S. intelligence, and uh, Galen's Eastern Front intelligence outfit, from de Hera Ost, or Foreign Armies East, metamorphosed into, first of all, the CIA's Department of Russian and Eastern European Affairs, the de facto NATO intelligence organization, and ultimately the BND, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, the West German, now German intelligence service. Uh, the BND is a remarkable institution, and uh, if not unique, is certainly extraordinary in uh, the annals of political and military operations. Uh, even while serving as the West German intelligence service, or as the intelligence service for the Federal Republic of Germany, it was continuing to support both the U.S. and NATO with the vast bulk of its intelligence. And it's worth noting that uh, even when uh, Reinhard Galen was ostensibly a prisoner of war, and ostensibly is, is the word, uh, he was flown into the United States in the uniform of a four-star general, an American four-star general, given the pay of an American four-star general, and yet was still reporting to his superiors. He was clearing everything he was doing with the Americans, with Admiral von Dönitz, and with uh, General Franz Halder, his former chief of staff. Now, in this same time period, uh, the latter part of World War II and the immediate aftermath, a couple of other very interesting things happened as well. Not only was Alan Dulles negotiating with Giro von Gevernitz to realize the Christian West concept, uh, Gevernitz acting as a proxy for ITT director and SS intelligence operative Walter Schellenberg, but and, uh, ultimately it is Giro von Gevernitz who introduces uh, Siebert to Galen and helps set up that particular axis, and I use that term advisor. Alan Dulles is also entering into negotiations with SS General Karl Wolf, last name W-O-L-F-F, who was Himmler's personal adjutant, and Alan Dulles was negotiating with Wolf to effect a surrender of all SS forces in Italy to the Allies, rather than surrendering them to the Italian partisans, who were basically going to shoot them all. Uh, the interesting thing is that the key element involved, or one of the key elements involved in setting up this liaison between Wolf and Dulles were some of the members of the Stennis family, who were also very prominent in Italy as well. So again, uh, these elite corporate connections figure prominently in the establishment of some of these transatlantic German and American national security liaisons. Ultimately, Dulles did uh, effect the surrender of the uh, forces in Italy, although uh, the, it was not actually accomplished under Alan Dulles's, uh auspices, but the negotiations were carried on and ultimately put into effect. It's interesting that some of Alan Dulles's correspondence at this time is quite interesting. For example, in his correspondences with Karl Wolf, again, Himmler's personal adjutant in the SS, uh, Dulles notes that, quote, I am not in principle, and this is verbatim, I am not in principle opposed to national socialism. I just wish you people would be a little, I just wish that you were a little more intelligent about the Jewish question. In other words, basically, what he's saying, to, to unravel the uh, equivocal language, is I'm sympathetic to Nazism, I just wish you were a little more subtle about when he was sticking it to the Jews. That's basically what he was saying, and uh, that is consistent with Alan Dulles' operations throughout the course of his professional life. Now, another interesting thing about the close of World War II, uh, people may have noted that after Hitler's ostensible suicide, in fact, evidence has come to light that he escaped, but... The person who nominally succeeded Hitler as head of state was Admiral Karl von Dönitz of the German Navy. In reality, both the Nazi party and the German state went underground, and the extremely formidable and deadly Bormann organization was the economic and corporate component of the underground Reich, and uh, Martin Bormann, along with the head of the Gestapo, Heinrich Müller, went underground and literally maintained the Nazi party underground in the post-World War II period. But the ostensible head of state who succeeded Hitler was Admiral Karl von Dönitz. I, for a long time, 
of wondered why why von Dönitz as opposed to you know Himmler, Goering. There were all sorts of rivalries within the Nazi hierarchy, but I wondered about that. And it was not until I began studying these, some of these connections that uh, I learned that Admiral von Dönitz also was an in-law of the Stinnes family. Again, uh, a central element in this same transatlantic financial and industrial elite axis, which has had so much to do with shaping uh, the, post, the war, pre-World War II, World War II, and post World War II world. Beyond that, uh, in, connect, in uh, keeping with the Christian West negotiations, what uh, von Dönitz was hoping to do, along with some of the other uh, less deluded uh, members of the Nazi hierarchy, because it was not realistic to expect the Christian West to happen while the guns were shooting. It did, in fact, happen uh, after the war. Uh, in fact, Nazi elements were put right back in power at all levels in Germany. This is not to say that, you know, all Germans or even most Germans are Nazis. That's not true. That wasn't even true in the Hitler period. But rather, the same elements were put back in power. The same political figures, the same intelligence service, Galen, uh, the same military officers, the same industrialists, the same financiers. Germany was never decarbonized. The same people went right back into business. The same uh, jurists, the same law, uh, the same lawyers, the same prosecutors. Many of the same laws. The German Supreme Court in 1981, for example, uh, established the conviction of Martinez von der Lubbe, the low nut who supposedly burned the Reichstag, as unchallengeable German law. The uh, same civil service, uh, the uh, draft uh, provision 131 of the German, uh, the Article 131 rather of the uh, provisional German Constitution, uh, made it mandatory to have been a member of the civil service under Hitler to be admitted to the post World War II supposedly non-Nazi civil service. And Article 132 forbade anybody who had been excluded from the German civil service under Hitler from serving in the post World War II German civil service. So the Christian West concept was put into effect. However, behind this after World War II, and with a relatively thin democratic facade. This is not to say that there is not real democracy to a certain extent. In Germany, there is. I would say that to a certain extent, the same thing applies in the United States, because we have what is really more of a democratic facade now than anything else, and people who cross this same elite, such as John F. Kennedy, get their brains blown out. And then they have people like Alan Dulles, who was fired by Kennedy for lying to him about the Bay of Pigs, serving on the Warren Commission to investigate, his, allegedly investigate his murder. But uh, it's interesting that as World War II was drawing to a close, the person who was named to nominally at least succeed Adolf Hitler as head of state was Karl von Dönitz, who was an in-law of the Stinnes family. Beyond that, von Dönitz set up a uh, shop, so to speak, in Flensburg. And what he was looking to do was to basically set up a rump government, which would then be recognized by the Allies, and they would immediately turn around the remnants of the German uh, armed forces, which would then join with uh, enthusiasts like uh, George pa uh, Patton uh, in an anti-Soviet crusade. Remember, Patton was basically uh, advocating that we simply rearm the Germans, and he would make frequent references to, boy, if I could get my Germans, you know, into, into uniform and with, with uh, and, and uh, under arms again, we could really kick the, the, kick the Ruskies, you know what. Uh, it was the hope of the Christian Westers that by setting up a, a hitler rump government headed by, again, an in-law of the Stinnes family, a major player in this elite uh, transatlantic financial and industrial networking and political networking that I'm talking about, uh, that ultimately they could uh, realize the Christian West concept. It's interesting that Flensburg was actually uh, being guarded by the Gross Deutschland Division, a Waffen-SS division, and was issuing its own postage stamps and currency and it, in hopes of it, it being given political legitimacy by the Western Allies. This didn't happen, but it's interesting to note why von Dönitz wound up in this particular position, in my opinion at least, because of these all-important uh, connections that I've been talking about, and the Stinnes family in particular. Now, ultimately, uh, of course, the uh, Christian West concept, a Hitlerless Reich, was put into effect in Germany as the anti-Soviet uh, forces coalesced, as the dreams of the Christian Westers were realized, and as the major movers and players in this transatlantic financial and industrial axis began to shape in a profound way the post-World War II world. Now, uh, ultimately, the OSS... Uh, in many ways gave rise to the CIA, which was established by the National Security Act. Uh, it came into being in 1947, and many of the key functionaries with the CIA and uh, many of the people who uh, worked with it, although not actually members of it, were veterans of the OSS. Uh, one of the key people was Frank Wisner, again, very prominent Wall Street lawyer, a partner in Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn. At one point when uh, Wisner was Deputy Director of Central Intelligence, another Deputy Director of Central Intelligence, Harding Jackson, was also a major partner in Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn. Uh, 
Frank Wisner played a profound role in the post-World War II world. He had a lot to do with the incorporation of the Galen-related elements uh, into our national security establishment. Uh, he also set up something called the Office of Policy Coordination, or OPC, nominally a State Department uh, institution. It was actually sort of a clearinghouse to coordinate elements of CIA with elements of the military and other governmental elements to uh, effect covert operations. And Frank Wisner's uh, top aide at the OPC, or one of his top functionaries, was Carmel Offey. Now, he again was the person who was serving as basically the right-hand man of William Bullitt at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in the mid-1930s. Another of the major architects of post-World War II American national security policy was State Department official George Keenan. Again, last name K-E-N-N-A-N. Keenan had been a key State Department official in Moscow under Bullet with Carmel Offey, where he began networking with key Third Reich diplomat and Eastern specialist, quote unquote, Gustav Hilger, H I L G E R, again, uh, an individual who was one of the main architects of the uh, German Ostpolitik. And later, when all of these people, in a sense, graduate, when Frank Wisner graduates from OSS to CIA, when Carmel Offey graduates from the State Department to the OPC, uh, uh, basically, in essence, CIA, and when George Keenan moves on up in the Department of State, who does he bring into the United States as a top advisor to the United States on Soviet affairs? Gustav Hilger, with whom, again, he had been networking in Moscow under William Bullitt in the 1930s. Frank Wisner, by the way, was also one of the main architects of what has become known as the Mighty Wurlitzer. One of the, one of the things that has been most destructive to the United States in the Cold War period was the establishment of the CIA's media component. Because the Soviet Union under Stalin had a totalitarian press, it was deemed necessary and essential for the United States to establish something similar to this. It was, it was felt that if we had a free and open media, this would work to our disadvantage in our struggle with a, what was obviously a totalitarian state, the Soviet Union under Stalin. So what Wisner did was to set up a uh, counterbalancing American media component, basically a government-controlled, national security-controlled media component to shape American journalism in the fashion desired by the national security establishment. Wisner termed this the mighty Wurlitzer after a giant theater organ that could make all sorts of noises and effects. And uh, that has had much to do with corrupting the American media in the post-World War II period. By the way, it was set up, the operating model for the Wurlitzer was uh, the propaganda ministry of Nazi Germany under Joseph Goebbels. That was what, what uh, Wisner used. Wisner, again, heavily involved with bringing in many of these same uh, Galen alumni in the post-World War II period. And uh, we should also note, ultimately, that uh, it was George Keenan, as I said, who was the architect of rollback theory, or of containment theory, rather, which was the first of the two major stratagems that was adopted by the United States in the Cold War. The idea was to, could, to mobilize American and Western forces at all levels, military, diplomatic, and intelligence, as well as economic and journalistic, uh, to contain the Soviet Union and communism around the world. Eventually... Keenan's containment theory gave way to a more militant and Nazi-inspired uh, tactic uh, to, for pursuing the Cold War, one which ultimately proved to be dominant, namely liberation or rollback theory. Uh, after the initial German experience in World War II, and this is another one of my typically short lectures, we're, <laughs> we're going to have about a half hour for questions here, but after, after uh, the initial German policy towards uh, the Slavs in the former Soviet Union, which is that they were uh, racially inferior and should be either exterminated or enslaved, as uh, the war of attrition on the Eastern Front took its toll, uh, some of the German uh, Ost experts or East experts, such as Alfred Rosenberg, for example, the head of the Ost Ministerium, advocated that uh, the the Third Reich ally with many of the dissident Soviet ethnic nationalities and promised them their at least nominal independence from the Soviet Union if they would ally with Germany and overthrow the Soviet Union. Uh, this became a major Third Reich political uh, warfare and covert action strategy in the latter uh, couple of years of World War II, and it was then adopted by the United States and the Galen-allied, uh, more militant cold warriors in the United States. And when the Crusade for Freedom took place, the Crusade for Freedom was an illegal domestic U.S. intelligence operation, which was the godchild, by the way, of Alan Dulles. This entailed not only a huge media blitz, uh, in uh, the American media to advocate rollback or liberation theory. Again, a political warfare and covert action strategy that had its genesis with the Third Reich and the, uh, Rosenberg's Ostministerium. 
Uh, the Crusade for Freedom brought in many of these Galen uh, allied forces, veterans, for example, of the Romanian Iron Guard, the Hungarian Arrow Cross, the Bulgarian National Front, the Croatian Ustashi, uh, some of the uh, Ukrainian and Baltic Waffen SS veterans. Again, uh, doctrinaire fascists, many of them war criminals of the First Order, allied with Nazi Germany, or in some cases actually part of Nazi Germany. Uh, many of these people were brought into the United States illegally. And, ordered, and were established as uh, leaders in the various uh, uh, American ethnic, uh, Eastern European ethnic communities. And ultimately, they coalesced into a branch, and literally a Nazi branch of the Republican Party, the Republican Ethnic Outreach Council. Uh, that is, to this day, viewed as being able to deliver the swing vote in five key states in presidential election years. Initially, these people were brought in, again, completely illegally, under State Department auspices, and were installed in positions of leadership in some of the Eastern European ethnic communities communities to counteract the traditional uh, New Deal generated uh, Roosevelt uh, forces or Roosevelt uh, sympathetic forces in uh, many of these communities. Again, the uh, person who hatched this policy, uh, which on the one hand entailed a huge media blitz on behalf of rollback or liberation theory, uh, its budget was so large that the uh, budget for the Crusade for Freedom, again, an altogether inappropriately named institution, was uh, the equivalent of the combined media allocations for the Republican and Democratic National Committees for elections at all levels in the 1952 campaign, both presidential, senatorial, and congressional. A considerable budget. Uh, and it also brought in many of these fascist collaborators, or fascists, frankly, to install them in positions of political leadership in the United States for the purposes of fomenting political reaction. The person who uh, crew, basically uh, devised the crusade for freedom was Alan Dulles, again, senior partner with uh, Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, his protege, the person who oversaw it from day to day, was Richard Nixon, who obviously later went on to become uh, president of the United States, and who, as president of the United States, coalesced this uh, Nazi Eastern European emigre group into a formal wing of the Republican Party, the Republican Ethnic uh, Outreach Council. The person who was the chief spokesperson for the Crusade for Freedom was a uh, young uh, B-grade movie actor named Ronald Reagan, who also eventually went on, to, obviously, to become president of the United States. And the person who handled the State Department machinations to bring these people into the U.S. illegally was a key former OSS operative in charge of secret intelligence in Europe for the OSS named William Casey, who later, of course, became director of the Securities and Exchange Commission under uh, Richard Nixon, who oversaw the Crusade for Freedom, later became Ronald Reagan's campaign manager, and ultimately became director of the CIA. Eventually, rollback or liberation theory uh, coalesced into the dominant uh, American stratagem for fighting the Cold War. Eisenhower, however, despite uh, paying lip service to rollback or liberation theory, uh, in practice remained committed to containment theory. Uh, in my opinion, that ultimately led uh, the uh, rollback or liberation forces to begin using covert action and uh, the use of deadly force at home in order to change the domestic political environment in such a way as to make it sympathetic to rollback or liberation theory. Ultimately, and one of the major uh, tactics that they hope to use to uh, overthrow communism also had its gener genesis with the Third Reich or a Third Reich allied organization. That was a white Russian fascist group called the NTS or the Solidarists or the National Toilers Alliance. These were a group of white Russian fascists who worked with Third Reich intelligence in World War II. Uh, they later had a break with some of the uh, organizations like the Ukrainian fascists under Bandera because they wanted to break the Soviet Union up into its constituent ethnic republics along the lines of rollback or liberation theory. The Solidaris wanted to keep the Russian Empire intact, but under a fascist government. So there were some divisions there. But the tactic that the Solidarists hoped to use, and that they advocated that the uh, Ostministerium of the Third Reich use, and that later U.S. intelligence used, was appealing to some of the elite cadres within the Soviet Communist Party, in particular the Red Army, to stimulate or promote a Red Army revolt against the Soviet government as a vehicle for overthrowing communism. What we ultimately saw in 1991 was a use of the Solidarist tactic, namely a Red Army revolt against the Soviet leadership, which overthrew the Soviet leadership and which led to the realization of the strategy of rollback or liberation theory, the dissolution of the Soviet Union into its constituent ethnic republics, uh, the ultimate goal of rollback or liberation theory. Uh, in the 1950s, as I indicated earlier, this old boy network, this uh, American elite, uh, wielded uh, power probably about as above board and as uh, 
freely as they ever had. Uh, when Dwight Eisenhower was elected president in the 19, uh, 1952, uh, and when the Republican campaign was inextricably linked with the crusade for freedom, again, a completely illegal domestic intelligence operation. We're actually seeing with the crusade for freedom uh, a synthesis between Republican uh, politics and illegal domestic covert operation. Arthur Bliss Lane, one of the major functionaries uh, and one of the major coordinators for the 52 Republican campaign, was also doubling as one of the major functionaries for the crusade for freedom. And uh, when Eisenhower was elected in 52, he appointed as Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, the uh, unabashed Nazi sympathizer and uh, uh, pro-Nazi functionary of Sullivan and Cromwell, and he installed as Director of Central Intelligence his brother, Alan Dulles, who had been uh, one of the major players in all of these machinations that I was talking about in Bern, Switzerland, uh, while the war was actually going on. And bear in mind, again, and this is by way of repetition, that uh, one of the deputy directors of Central Intelligence at this point was Frank Wisner, OSS veteran and senior partner with Carter Ledyard and Milburn, another of these major Wall Street law firms, and that another deputy director of Central Intelligence at this time, Harding Jackson, was also a partner in Carter Ledyard and Milburn. Ultimately, uh, rollback or liberation theory uh, was not was rejected by President Kennedy to his uh, eternal uh, dissatisfaction, I guess one could say. He, of course, was assassinated, and uh, Alan Dulles, among others, then sat at, who had been fired by a, uh, John F. Kennedy for lying to him about the Bay of Pigs, was uh, and was seated on the Warren Commission to ostensibly investigate Kennedy's murder, along with, by the way, another of these major Wall Street lawyers, John J. McCloy of uh, Milbank, Tweed, Hadley, and McCloy. Uh, McCloy had been Assistant Secretary of War under Henry Stimson, another member of this old boy network. Uh, McCloy was chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank, which had collaborated with Hitler and was allowed to do business in Paris even after the German occupation. That, of course, a Rockefeller Bank, the Rockefeller Industrial and Financial Empire, inextricably linked with Nazi finance and industry. And uh, old, uh, by the way, John J. McCloy was uh, Hitler's personal guest at the 1936 Olympics and watched the Olympiad from Hitler's box. Uh, he then was installed as U.S. High Commissioner of Germany, turned all of these Galen-related elements loose, re-instituted uh, them into the German and or American national security establishments. He also was a member of the Warren Commission to ostensibly investigate uh, the assassination of President Kennedy. So that, uh, in a nutshell, albeit a relatively large nutshell, uh, is uh, how the CIA as an institution and much of the power politics of the 20th century evolved from what was really a relatively small, albeit consummately powerful group of American elitists and Wall Street corporate lawyers. And uh, it's how much of the U.S. intelligence system derived, its, or the CIA, I should say, derived its character from the functioning of Wall Street law. Some of its botched covert operations, such as the Bay of Pigs, in many ways, not unlike uh, the way that lawyers are able to walk away from a case uh, with their fat fees, even if their client lost, even if the client's on death row, the lawyer still gets paid and they walk away and they continue to practice law. You know, the client gets fried or gassed or hung or whatever, but the, the, the lawyer continues to practice. And in many ways, some of the either botched and or counterproductive covert operations of the post-World War II period, such as uh, the Bay of Pigs, in many ways reflect the fact that the CIA as an institution grew directly out of not only the Wall Street elite, but specifically the corporate lawyers who uh, were involved with shepherding around those major power interests and with structuring the uh, 20th century to a large extent. Thanks so much. We've got, and again, these, 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 by the way, are not, not just sunglasses. They're also bifocals for my uh, increasingly middle-aged eyes. We've got about a half hour until we've got to wrap things up. I'll take questions either about the subject of the lecture or about uh, something else. Let's proceed. Start with the gentleman in the back. Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, you were bringing the story up into the end of World War II. I just happened to get my hands on a tape, a uh, religious tape that talks about King Juan Carlos of Spain. And uh, I know that some of the Nazis for Spain was like a uh, haven for some of the Nazis after the war. Let me, let me just interject briefly that Francisco Franco was a fascist installed by Hitler and Mussolini and that Spain served as a major Nazi epicenter throughout the course of World War II, according to this one German spine diplomat. That's where Donovan agreed to the Christian West negotiations. It later became basically the epicenter for what was quite literally a Nazi government in exile operating out of Madrid and exercising control over the Christian West uh, realized Germany through a uh, what was called a Führungsring, a system of mafia-like control through 
small three to six man underground cells which honeycombed Germany and which uh, administered power throughout the Federal Republic but administered from uh, on the one hand uh, Madrid and the Nazi government in exile and then uh, ultimately you go across to Latin America to the uh, remarkable and deadly Bormann organization and uh, Martin Bormann and Heinrich Müller uh, literally running the NSDAP in exile. Yes, go ahead. What I wanted to bring up uh, is the fact that uh, this, uh, the, the guy who's doing the research on um, King Wan was saying that, you know, oh, you know, he's, we're putting the royalty back on the throne. So uh, he was supposed to be doing a big shakeup, you know, and uh, people didn't know if, you know, we should have the royalty back. But uh, what I was saying is this guy has, or this man has spent his whole life in the military. You know what I'm saying? He's uh, he's very deeply into it, and uh, he's Wouldn't, also very religious. Which man was this? I mean, the King person Juan. who gave you the t oh, King Juan Carlos. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, the thing that uh, 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 scares me is the fact that he has uh, a, seems to have a veneer of, uh, of cloaking. You know, no one po focuses uh, influence on him or attention on him, but at the same time, he is able to travel the you know elite world and push this agenda of, of, of upgrading, of, of modernizing the military schools, police schools, you know what I'm saying? So that you're able to uh, 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 have this close marriage between uh, uh, government and the elite uh, or, or the business world and the elite and the police and the military, be it you know, of any country, you know what I'm saying? Because if she's such an international person. You know, I was just surprised at the extent to which he is really deeply into the military. You know? King Juan Carlos? Yes. Well, would that, I wouldn't be, I, he's not a person I know a great deal about it. I don't think that as an individual figure he's necessarily all that important. But given the fact that, that Spain was a fascist dictatorship, from the late 1930s right on up to the mid-1970s and that uh, with bureaucratic and in institutional inertia being what they are, uh, many of the institutions in Spain have retained much of that. And given the fact that Spain is a conservative Catholic country, I, I don't think it should be all that surprising uh, to view King Juan Carlos and to see him as being uh, something other than uh, a flaming liberal. That, 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 it makes sense to me. I don't think he's necessarily all that important as a player on the international stage, though. It would give, given some of the other uh, blood letters and bad men that are that have ascended over the years. So, but we'll be interesting to see what happens over a period of time. Yes, the gentleman there. Hi, I'd like to ask uh, what your thoughts are about uh, uh, this Andreas Strassmeyer and his connection to the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, specifically. Uh, when I first heard about Oklahoma City bombing, I thought, aha, it's like bombing the Reichstag, and not surprisingly, a year after the Oklahoma City bombing the so-called anti-terrorism law that passed. So can mm -hmm. you comment on that one way or the other? Yeah, Andre Strassmeier is the son of Gunter Strassmeier, who was Helmut Kohl's former chief of staff. He was also uh, one of the security directors for Elohim City, a white supremacist compound that Timothy McVeigh was uh, known to frequent. According to an ATF informant, Carol Howe, who uh, passed a, a polygraph test, uh, it was Strassmeier who was the mastermind of the Oklahoma City bombing and that McVeigh was basically his protege. Uh, there's another interview with Martin Lee that you're going to be hearing, which will kick some of this stuff around. Uh, Andreas Strassmeier, well, this is one that, 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 that I just recorded uh, last Sunday, so you would not have heard this. So it will be coming down you know, presently it'll, as it comes down the, the, the Spitfire pipeline, to, to mix a metaphor. Um, the Oklahoma City situation is a rather complex one. I do not think, as elements of the right do, that it was a provocation set up to justify the passage of the uh, counterterrorism bill. Because indeed, what we're being told uh, as part of the official story is that it was perpetrated, the uh, Oklahoma City bombing, by two lone nuts, you know, McVeigh and Nichols. Uh, simply from a practical standpoint, the logistics of an operation like that would have to be uh, would be inaccessible to simply two people, particularly those two people. I mean, McVeigh was a, a military veteran. Nichols was basically kind of a punk. I mean, he served in the in the military too. But the two of them could not pull that off. There remain uh, the question of who was John Doe number two. My own feeling, and that, and I can only, I can really cannot do justice to an analysis of the Oklahoma City bombing in the time that we have here. I have, however, uh, done a couple of other lectures about that and also a related lecture called The Militia Movement, Enemy or Pawn of the State. And uh, when we adjourn here, not only tonight's lecture, but also some of the others are either available for purchase or can be ordered from She Who Remembers. This will give you a better take on that than I could in the limited time we have here. I think the United States is in a state of an advanced state of subversion 
uh, part of which is coming from abroad and part of which is coming from within, that is analogous to the subversion of France prior to World War II by the fifth and sixth columns in France, who uh, were basically French fascists who later went on to uh, be the core of the Vichy fascist collaborationist government, uh, and also industrialists and financiers who were allied through some of these same cartel agreements with their German counterparts. Uh, France was in many ways subverted prior to World War II. There was an abortive fascist coup in France in 1938 that was uh, launched by the two main French fascist groups, the Croix de Feu, or Cross of Fire, and the Cagoule, or les Cagoulards, the so-called hooded ones. These were uh, clandestine French fascist groups with uh, generous representation in the, the French elite, not only the industrial and financial elite, but the aristocracy, the uh, uh, profound, the, the very influential Catholic clergy were also quite sympathetic to fascism. Uh, much of the French military and political leadership, as well as the police, were sympathetic to fascism because at this time, uh, France was under a democratically elected and very moderate socialist government, the social front of Léon Blum. And uh, many of the French reactionaries were much more comfortable with the idea of having France occupied by German fascists than they were by uh, they were at the prospect of having Léon Blum continue in power. It's one of the reasons why France, which is not only a larger country than Germany, but which had a larger and at least on paper more powerful military, capitulated, capitulated so quickly during World War II. There was some serious... Uh, strategic and tactical errors on the part of the French military in the opinions of many that were deliberately done in order to, quote, as Maréchal Pétain, the uh, head of the Vichy government, said, to save the French army for the fight against communism, unquote. Uh, I believe that, uh, and it's, it's important to understand that the method of Nazi political conquest was different from what people generally think of in terms of conquest in that it uh, does not necessarily primarily, or in the case of the United States at all, involve the sending of armies crashing across a country's borders, but rather the utilization of political and economic elements sympathetic to the fascist cause in order to effect a metamorphosis in that society, not unlike the way a virus uh, invades a cell and sticks its nu nucleic acid into a cell, and the cell, instead of reproducing more of its own kind, reproduces more viruses. Uh, that is, in, in a sense, the, the Nazi form of subversion, which is not unlike uh, much of U.S. covert operation in the post-World War II period, uh, could, could be compared with the action of a virus infecting a cell. And I think that the United States is in an advanced state of subversion, both by a domestic fascist milieu, which in my opinion is in power in both industry and finance, politics, and uh, to a certain extent at least the national security establishment. And I believe that it is also allied with what I have termed the underground Reich and with a never effectively denazified Germany now having its Nazi elements uh, assert themselves above board and uh, more vociferously. Uh, one of the possible reasons for a cover-up with regard to the Oklahoma City bombing, is the fact that uh, if Andreas Strassmeyer was in fact involved with uh, Oklahoma City, as has been maintained, or even if he was simply uh, revealed to be who he was, namely the son of Helmut Kohl's former chief of staff and one of the main architects, by the way, of German reunification. And he, by the, it, Andreas Strassmeyer was also present at the reunification ceremony attended by the chancellor and his father, which means that Andreas Strassmeyer would have had to have a very high, high, an official German government security clearance, and he's a former German military officer, could prove very embarrassing to Helmut Kohl and also to political figures in the United States who have been touting Germany as, you know, the, the uh, flowering of democracy, you know, no more Hitler, and look at how, look at the marvelously democratic Germany as opposed to those nasty Soviets who were dictators and this, that, and the other thing. Then when you have a guy like Andreas Strassmeyer uh, setting up shop at uh, Elohim City, which is a Nazi com compound in the United States, when Kirk Lyons, a Nazi attorney in the United States, is the attorney for Andreas Strassmeyer, and sits down and uh, helps to shepherd him around and uh, con confers with Gunter Strassmeyer and his wife, his parents, uh, it could prove very embarrassing not only to Helmut Kohl and his government, but pretty embarrassing to the United States as well, and, and uh, certainly could do much to puncture the political mythology that has prevailed in the post-World War II period. I think that in all probability, the Nazi elements that pulled Oklahoma City off also overlap our own government. In other words, there are elements just as the abortive fascist coup in France, which had bombings, assassinations, kidnappings, affected by small terrorist cells of three to six men who overlapped the army, overlapped the police, overlapped all of these power elements. I think some of the, something very similar is true in the United States as well, and where you have elements like Newt Gingrich or Representative Chenoweth out of uh, Oregon or other uh, American political figures who are really very sympathetic to the militia situation. I think it, the 
dichotomization of the political uh, landscape into you know, the respectable politicians, such as you know, Newt Gingrich, if he could be deemed respectable. And then on the other hand, you have the militias, uh, uh, the patriots. In fact, it is a continuum. It is not that sort of a, a uh, discontinuity or the type of discontinuity that's been represented. I can't really do justice to the subject in this time, but there are at least three other lectures, Oklahoma City Update, the Oklahoma City bombing, and the lecture about the militia movement, and also the lecture about gun control, which are available from She Who Remembers and which will do a better job of answering your question than yeah, I've been able to. Bomb, I don't know. I don't know. There was a second uh, seismic report that audio. was reported. Johnny Cochran has an audio tape. Yeah. I really can't tell you uh, more than that. Uh, it certainly suggests that there may have been two bombs. I would not automatically assume that. Uh, if you've ever heard of heard gunfire uh, in an, an urban environment, they, the echoes can be pretty interesting, too. I would not dismiss the possibility of an echo, but I'm not an expert on such matters. Uh, from a methodological standpoint, when, when there was a bomb set off, for example, at a, uh, it was a lesbian nightclub in Atlanta uh, last year. Uh, actually, no, no, what, was this... Was this the one at the nightclub? No, this was at an abortion clinic in Atlanta. The methodology was used where they set off a bomb, and then when the federal investigators came to, then the second bomb went off base to try to kill federal agents. So whether there were two bombs for that reason, uh, it, 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 it's a matter of conjecture. I can't give you a definitive answer. I think it needs to, to uh, be pursued. Gentleman in the back, please, and then the gentleman over here. I just wanted to know what you think of uh, John Rappaport's uh the, uh, Oklahoma bomb. Uh, I think his work on Oklahoma is extremely weak. I can't comment directly on his hypothesis. Uh, I do not think it was a government provocation. I do think elements within the government along the line of the uh, scenario that I developed uh, and created, presenting what's going on in this country as analogous to the subversion of France. Uh, I think that there were elements within the government within the government that were complicit just as there were elements within the government that were complicit with the fascist terror campaign in France in the pre-World War II period, and which helped to cover it up, they then evolved, so to speak, into the Vichy government. Uh, Rappaport's book has no documentation at all. There isn't a single footnote or bibliographical reference, and for that reason, I think it's completely useless as a political document. If you're going to wage an intelligent, if you're going to uh, present an intelligent political argument, you've got to be able to source it, and there's no sourcing at all. So I think. As a document, it's completely useless for that reason. There's absolutely no annotation or documentation. Uh, there are a lot of questions about Oklahoma City. I'm not a bomb expert. For example, some people have talked about the absence of uh, debris on the roof. That's something to be considered. There's certainly in the, in the few pictures I've seen of the roof, there does not appear to be much, if any. Uh, if, if the scenario presented in the book Blood Oath is accurate, it may very well be that the bombing of Oklahoma City, which according to the two Carl Jaspers and Stephen Worth, was pulled off by cause, the same Nazi group that uh, killed Ron and Nicole and framed OJ. Uh, and bear in mind that one of the focal points of Operation Thunderbolt, as the uh, Simpson uh, gambit was, was termed, was not only to start a race war and to dispatch someone they viewed as a race traitor, Nicole, and to destroy an race mixer, O.J. Simpson, but it was to discredit law enforcement in general, uh, the LAPD in particular, and to uh, alter the judicial process, which was done, by the way, on September 4, 1996. A law was passed in the California State Legislature specifically for the O.J. Simpson civil case and in virtual secret to permit hearsay evidence to be introduced into a trial in California. That law is still on the books. That was how Nicole's diary was introduced into the civil case. That's hearsay evidence, and prior to the introduction of this law would not have been admissible in court. So, extrapolating to Oklahoma City, now that some of the people involved in Operation Thunderbolt, according to Jaspers and Worth, were military and intelligence and law enforcement veterans, including people who were former Green Beret, and would have, as a result, considerable expertise in the use of explosives and demolitions and uh, other forms of combat arms. It may be, and this is one of the hypotheses that I hold open, I'm not saying this is necessarily the case, but for example, one observer has maintained that uh, explosive charges, the, the pattern of destruction of the federal building uh, indicates that explosive charges had been placed in some of the support columns, collapsing it from within. I, I don't know enough about explosives to comment on that directly, but if that, if that is in fact the case, I would not automatically assume that, therefore, the government was responsible, but it may be that elements who either had or were still working within the government pulled that off in that fashion in order to, once again, discredit law enforcement and government in general, as Jaspers and Worth maintained Operation Thunderbolt was intended uh, to do. Uh, 
it's pretty clear that there's more to Oklahoma City than what we have been told. And again, we're, we're talking about something that I've lectured about in the past. There are other lectures available from She Who Remembers, which will flesh it out. I think the rhetoric on all sides with regard to Oklahoma City and the militias and Patriots networks is completely inadequate. It's tended to be dichotomized. It's either the government or it's the militias. And uh, I don't think that is accurate. I think that, uh, for example, uh, there are elements within the militia and patriots networks who are sincerely democratic. They're real conservatives, uh, albeit generally badly misinformed. And if you think the United Nations is going to occupy the United States using Russian troops from black, dropped from black helicopters, you shouldn't be playing with guns. Um, the, uh, on the other hand, however, uh, there are elements of the patriots and militia networks which I think are actually an extension of some elements of the government. Now, I'm not talking about the provocation scenario that Nazi elements like the Liberty Lobby are advancing, but rather, if you study the martial law contingency plans that were put on the books by Oliver North and Company, one of the provisions for the uh, establishment and realization of the martial law plans is the deputization of paramilitary right-wing groups and their use as federal agents and informers. I suspect that, in fact, that is merely a formalization of something that has, in fact, been established. We know that, that uh, paramilitary right-wingers, including Nazi elements, have been used as mercenaries and as uh, soldiers of fortune for covert operations in the past. Uh, the conflict in uh, Zimbabwe uh, slash Rhodesia being an example of that. Uh, I suspect that in the 1960s, something, uh, in the, or perhaps even earlier, something similar to uh, Operation Stay Behind or Operation Gladio, uh, which was a NATO contingency plan to uh, set up guerrilla groups to uh, fight in Europe in the event of a communist takeover, either a Soviet invasion, which was never contemplated, or possibly would have resulted in all of Europe and the rest of the world burning. Uh, but in the event of a, what, what could have happened, conceivably, would have been a democratic communist takeover in, for example, Italy, which had a very large and effective communist party. Uh, NATO set up, uh, basically, Operation Stay Behind, which set up underground uh, military cells to uh, form guerrilla movements in the event of a communist takeover, and they utilized many fascist elements dating from World War II. The uh, Grey Wolves and National Action Party elements in Turkey, uh, many of the Italian fascisti associated with the MSI in Italy, so many of the fascist collaborators in Greece. Many of these programs ultimately gave rise to, for example, Operation Gladio and the strategy, and the, uh, the strategy of tension in Italy. Uh, many of the fascist elements associated with uh, Operation Stay Behind in Greece effected and again, these are elements that had collaborated with Hitler during the occupation of Greece in World War II, affected the Greek juntas uh, takeover in 1967, uh, with a very powerful uh, anti-Vietnam War movement with uh, rioting in the American cities in the 1960s, uh, with the student rebellions in Paris in April of 68, with elements of confluence between uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement and the black and brown power movements in California. It would not have, I, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that something very similar to that was put together in the United States as well, utilizing organizations like the Minutemen, Nazi elements, uh, as uh, basically government operatives to set up guerrilla groups in the event of, an, of uh, a, quote, communist takeover, unquote, in the United States. As ridiculous as that seems to us now, if you're a GS-18, you know, who's uh, part of an old military family that traces its lineage back to Colonel Mosby in the Civil War, and, you know, you've graduated from the Citadel, and uh, you're now, you know, a, a full bird colonel in the Army, uh, you have a very different outlook on things than, say, the people who are seated here. Uh, and I suspect that something, something similar to Operation Stay Behind was put together in the United States, that these paramilitary right-wing groups, some of which, some of them actually were uh, put on a government payroll, and that it may be that some of those seeds that were sown are now bearing the kind of fruit in the United States that they bore in places like Italy and Greece, where some of those, uh, some of those underground fascist elements working as proxies for NATO and for the National Security Services uh, began launching a program, programs of right-wing terror and assassination, or in some cases actually affecting a coup, yet they could not be fully investigated in those machinations because they were on a government payroll. I'm not saying necessarily that that is the case, but it's something I hold open. And again, uh, some of the pre other lectures that I've mentioned uh, will touch on it. Let's have a, quest a co question or comment about something other than Oklahoma City or the militia, since that's dominated everything so far. Uh, lady in the first row. Which one? <laughs> well, for, first you, then you, and we'll go around. We're not going to have not gonna have time to, to cover it all before five when we got a split. Uh, but. I just wondered if you had maybe um, had any tapes that were maybe more current uh, than the one that you did with Walter Boart on uh, mind control. Um, 
I, I have a really hard time believing that my abduction experiences are strictly a mind control type trauma based disposal program by um, you know <coughs> the forces that be and I know that uh, that's pretty much your opinion on the abduction yeah they, I, I've done, done some work I'm going to have to answer this quickly because we're, we're running low on time and there are other people but uh, there is no substantive evidence at all none that we have ever been visited by aliens. Now, this is not to say that UFOs are not real. The evidence is very strong that they are real, but they are not from outer space. They're advanced aeronautic devices from Earth. There is a great deal of evidence indicating that the alien contact deception is just that, and that it was deliberately manufactured and is perpetuated by elements of our own national security establishment. A uh, very good book in that regard is a book called Revelations by Jacques Vallée. Also the book uh, Messengers of Deception about the UFO contactee cults. When many of the contactees have been deprogrammed, it's turned out that many of these aliens turned out to have been people who were taking them not into flying saucers but vans and uh, panel trucks and things of that kind. I've never seen any, any evidence at all that would indicate that we've been visited by aliens. On the contrary, every one of these well-publicized alien contactees has turned out not only to be obvious and complete BS, but national security generated BS. And uh, I can appreciate that that is not something that would be satisfactory to you with your viewpoint, or it may not be a satisfactory answer. But I would, I would encourage you to, on the one hand, study the, uh, the, the books that I mentioned, uh, uh, Revelations and uh, The Messengers of Deception by Valet. Also, also, uh, study what can be done with mind control. Because the problem with mind control is that, you know, the thing is that when you're under mind control, you don't know you're under mind control. Right. And at least one person, I've forgotten, like, so what's the guy's name? The engineer at Area 51 who supposedly, you know, Bob Lazar, Bob Lazar, Bob Lazar right, who to his own credit is skeptical of his own, uh, own story. Because, I mean, this guy's supposed to reverse engineer alien technology using a voltmeter. I mean, it's a joke if you know anything about anything. It, 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 not, it couldn't. You're not going to reverse engineer an alien spacecraft with a voltmeter. And he knew enough to realize that that was absurd. But he also was forced to drink this liquid and had memory lapses and so forth. So there's at least one indication that, that, that the, the and, and that this is not to say that there is not something very unusual going on at Area 51. I think it is. But I don't think it has anything to do with outer space. I think it has a lot to do with mind control. And Bob Lazar himself believes that he may very well have been a victim of mind control. Well, it's just unusual that, um, you know, when abductees do come forward, all of a sudden they're harassed. There's military stuff going on. And it just doesn't seem like if they would feed that as a virtual memory. Study, study revelations, because the, the, the uh, deception is, is fairly complete. And they, the, uh, the deception is fairly sophisticated, I should say. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of indications that, uh, uh, that uh, the powers that be, or at least some elements of them, are going to great lengths to make us believe that we've been visited by aliens. And once again, because we're, we're running low on time to other people, I'm going to refer you to two other lectures that are available from She Who Remembers. One uh, is the lecture that I gave on the uh, UFO phenomenon, uh, the political implications of the UFO phenomenon and the ET myth. Because it had no, no, none of the alien contactee uh, experiences hold up under scrutiny. I mean, it just, the, the, the earliest ones were all associates of William Dudley Pelly, and the aliens are tall with long blonde hair and right, blue eyes yeah. and fair skin, which is you know, supposedly from Venus. Now, whatever, whatever would come from Venus isn't going to look like that if there were anything. Probably toxic gases is all you would find there. But there, there's, there's substantive uh, indications that, in fact, this is a deception. What I think they're ultimately going to do is ultimately going to happen is that uh, a stratagem is going to be utilized to eliminate democracy worldwide for the, literally the enslavement of the human race uh, the so-called UFOs, which are real, and the, quote, aliens, unquote, which aren't, but we, we were told they are real, and other forms of technology which have been kept secret and will appear to be miraculous and otherworldly to us are going to be utilized in what I think is going to be a cross between uh, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast and Miracle of Fatima and Pearl Harbor. And I think basically uh, people in this country and others are going to eat their thing on a roll with hot sauce. And, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen in the corner, and uh, then this lady, and then we'll try it. We're not going to be able to get to everybody. we got five minutes? Yeah. Completely yeah. change on everything. Loftus has done a good point on uh, elucidating the uh, uh, in British intelligence origins of BCCI. Mm -hmm. We know the history of that in New Hand. It's folding the uh, Chinese banks in Hong Kong, taking up the torch assets and stock at that point. They were controlled by the Lippo Group. And now the Lippo Group and the Riyadi's influence in uh, Indonesian oil and coal, and that intertie with the coal and oil in this country and so forth, and of course the things that are alleged. I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily jump you know, right from BCCI and Nugent Hand to those others. But well, that's, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you see any contacts there? That are uh, I'm not aware of any. That doesn't mean that there aren't. Uh, I mean, certainly BCCI and the Nugent Hand have operated in the same geographical areas. 
Uh, there are clandestine aspects of the operations of all three institutions. I have not seen any indication that the uh, Lippo Group uh, is an intelligence front, which both Nugent Hand and BCCI were. That doesn't mean they aren't. I have not seen any indications that they are. Let's try to get to a couple of other questions here. Uh, lady in front row. I just kind of heard this. Uh, it was on Roy's show, but just someone called in uh, that the EPA has been giving unprecedented powers in order to confiscate property, not just our cars, but homes. Being able to go the Environmental Protection yeah, Agency to go into your home and uh, unannounced, you have to let them in, and they'll check various things in your home. And if they're not fixed within a certain amount of time, they can confiscate your home and also your car. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, it, I'm not saying I'm not commenting directly on that on accuracy. Well, you know, I, I can't comment on as a general consideration that this is this is not to not to say yay or nay. Uh, if in fact, see, NAFTA is on on the public record. If in fact. NAFTA says that what I would do is actually research that from the document. There is a lot of disinformation coming from the right wing about the alleged abuses of one government agency or another, including the EPA. Now, and this is not to say that under NAFTA, the EPA might, might not be empowered to do other things. The EPA is, as, as environmental agencies go, is not only relatively benign, but has been all but gutted. You know, I mean, the, the EPA has been badly weakened. We actually need, I'm not saying an unlawful or unconstitutional EPA, but the EPA was scrapped by Ronald Reagan for all intents and purposes. You, people don't remember uh, Ann Gorsuch Burford. <coughs> You know, that she, she was one of the early Reagan functionaries, and she, she nailed the EPA to the cross. I mean, it, it was gutted, so it has very little real power. Uh, two things before, as you, yeah. You can contact an organization called La Loft. La Loft. Is that the one that came on when Sean was talking about? I can't about remember the name Because they actually yeah, were doing yeah, this. Yeah. They actually did this. Suzanne in Harris the over La Loft. Now, there, there are some really interesting things happening under the auspices of GATT and NAFTA with regard to environmental issues. For example, uh, the World Trade Organization obliged, forced the United States under GATT to permit uh, oil to be sold in the United States that does not meet American environmental regulations because that has too many additives. This in order to make foreign-based refineries competitive in our markets because these refineries cannot, do not have the uh, plant capability of producing sufficiently uh, pure fuel for the American market. And what, so therefore, those fuels were not allowed to be sold in the United States because they would pollute the air. Na uh, under GATT, the World Trade Organization did force us to uh, downgrade our own environmental standards in order to make uh, their, those fuels competitive. I don't know if that was actually done through the EPA. So there certainly is some really scary stuff that is attended upon GATT and NAFTA. Uh, I, I cannot comment directly on what you said. And uh, so what I would do is actually go to the documents and research that, because that should be a, a relatively knowable thing. Before we, uh, we file out here, which we're going to have to do, uh, two requests. Doug, have you got the hat back there? Yes. I know you all paid uh, generously to get in here. $10 is high for us. Uh,